This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. We all come here today for different reasons, but I think this bit of information from um, the Seattle Rape Relief Project um, is, causes great concern. Um, many of our individuals with developmental disabilities um, are exploited. And oftentimes, in fact, as you can see, 90% of the time, uh, the victim, the individual with a dis disability, uh, knows the perpetrator of this exploitation. And uh, there are a lot of things that our students need to learn, and our individuals um, that we care about need to learn. Uh, and I don't know why you came here today and what it is that you want to learn specifically, uh, but I'm hoping that what I share with you today will be of help. I want us to take a little test. How many of you printed out my handout? Anybody? Just, okay, just a couple people. So let's then do this as a group. If you have the handout, feel free to write on your handout. But this is a true-false test. Um, the first question or statement, basically um, all individuals with uh, developmental disabilities are asexual in nature. Is that true or false? false. You can just say your answer right out loud so uh, we can hear it. Typically, they have uncontrollable urges. False. False. Typically, they are never likely to have a relationship. False. False. Typically, they will never be exploited or hurt by anyone. False. Really, really false. Really, really false. Typically, they are always in safe, supervised environments. And people with developmental disabilities are just not sexually active. They have no interest in an intimate relationship. False. That is the case. And yet, oftentimes, these are reasons why education in the area of human sexuality are not covered because these are the misconceptions and the, the beliefs held out there about people with developmental disabilities. So let's look at some of the facts. The facts are that people with developmental disabilities actually have a range of sexual desires and ways of expressing themselves. They actually uh, need more uh, accurate training um, uh, for more appropriate relationships. Many lack appropriate training in human relationships and abuse prevention. And the abuse prevention is really critical. Most lack the rights and the privileges and the opportunities for privacy and normal intimacy because of their living environments, because of their ability to um, travel in the community, to be able to make some, some specific decisions about their life and their travels. Um, this is a big issue uh, and um, something that we could spend a lot of time on, uh, but just acknowledging that this is a fact that folks face. In fact, I had um, um, one individual say that basically they're oftentimes forced into celibacy or uh, rela other kinds of relationships that are not necessarily healthy simply because of their living arrangements uh, and the uh, 
ability to have privacy and privileges. Uh, and so these are some of the things that are the facts about um, our population that we're talking about. So when we talk about sexuality and human sexuality, what does this really mean? Well, from the World Health Organization in 1975, and I think that this is a pretty good um, uh, definition still today, sexuality is just an integral part um, of a personality of, of everyone, uh, man, woman, and child. And that's why I said it, whether you're preschool, working with preschoolers, or uh, young adults, or older adults, uh, and it just really can't be separated. It is not synonymous with sexual intercourse. Uh, and it influences the feelings and the actions and the interactions and thereby our mental and physical health. And yes, people with developmental disabilities, even if they have intellectual disabilities, are influenced by their own sexuality and the sexuality of others. Uh, and uh, it influences their mental and physical well-being. Now, when we define sex, sex can just simply mean the gender, of course, um, whether you're male or female, or it can actually mean the act of sexual intercourse. A lot of confusion around language sometimes, but we have to be clear about what we're talking about. Now, sexuality education, it's not a one-time event. Sometimes I was asked to go into group homes uh, when I was teaching. I'm, I'm no longer working in the, in the um, public sector. I, I retired. <laughs> Actually, I rewired myself in 07, and now I do more just lecturing and consulting uh, on a larger scale um, than just working with individual youngsters. But um, sexuality education is a lifelong process. It's just not going in one time, doing a one-time seminar, visiting the group home, talking about public and private, or something like that. It is an ongoing procedure that starts with the very young child. It includes many, many things, and not just the act of sexual intercourse, which when we say sex education, oftentimes people think that's what we're going to be talking about, sexual intercourse. But it, un it, it encompasses understanding your body, uh, the biological, the social cultural, uh, the psychological, and even the spiritual dimensions of sexuality and relationships. And that's what we have to recognize, that it is a very, very complex subject. And it's a subject that makes a lot of people uncomfortable. Uh, and that's one of the issues why our individuals with developmental disabilities oftentimes are not offered training and instruction to be able to be the best they can be in this area of life. So today, when I was asked last December to do this seminar and encouraged by my colleague Patty Shutter here uh, at The Mind and, and Dr. Robin Hansen, um, I said, well, what am I going to do in, you know, 90 minutes and, and whatever? And they said, well, just answer all the questions. And I said, well, like, okay, sure, I can do that. <laughs> and so I came up with this idea that I would try to answer in brief, of course, these following questions. Who needs to have this kind of education? When do we do it? What does it look like? Why do we do it? And how do we do it? It's a lot to cover. Of course, I'm not, <laughs> yeah, you're laughing, aren't you? <laughs> I'm not going to go in depth in any one of these areas, and you are going to participate. And you are going to be part of my classroom today in human sexuality. And you're going to go through uh, some program activities with me. Because part of being a sex educator is being comfortable in your own skin. And you can set up an activity for others to do, 
but you're going to have an opportunity to do the activities yourself today because that's truly how we all learn best is by doing it. So let's start with that who question. Who are we talking about? Well, for this seminar, we're talking about any person who learns differently. Any person that learns differently. So when you're working with someone, you need to know about that individual. You need to know their intellectual abilities. You need to know their learning styles. And you need to know what kind of prior knowledge or instruction that they've had. So I want to give you just a minute, and this means some of you are going to have to implement social skills. And turn around and introduce yourself to somebody that's sitting near you, and you're going to tell them, uh, keeping confidentiality, the, the intellectual abilities of the students that you're thinking about working with or are currently working with, what their learning styles are, and what kind of prior knowledge they have had or uh, haven't had. So I'm just going to give you a couple of minutes to do this. You may need to get up and move um, or turn around at least and uh, chat with somebody about who the students are that you are thinking about working with. You now kind of have an idea and you'll be getting some feedback and you are going to be working in groups uh, as we go through some of the activities here uh, in just a bit. Who is the teacher? We've just talked about who the, the, the individual is, the, the, the learner. Who is the teacher? Well, of course, in the beginning, it is the parent. The parent is the first teacher for everything, and we know that. And social sexual growth is extremely influenced by parents at a very early age through parental actions and words, touch, um, the way the family life goes, the way problems are solved, because all of these have to do with relationships, social relationships, and lay the groundwork for ultimately a personal relationship with someone other than a family member. But it starts within the family. And uh, parents are the first teachers for everybody. They're the first teachers for uh, sex ed. And uh, it's not so much um, talking as it is nonverbal. It's more the demonstration of relationships, of comfort, of caring. Because remember, sexuality uh, education is not learning how to have sexual intercourse. It's about learning how to have relationships that are positive and appropriate and how to keep yourself safe uh, from relationships that are not appropriate and that could be damaging. And so these are the kinds of things that we have to recognize that we also, as um, professionals, need to work with the families. And sometimes families, especially as the children get older, begin to feel real uncomfortable about talking about um, private situations or intimate relationships uh, or even personal things. Uh, I, I know that I had a fairly open relationship with my two children. My daughter's uh, turning 35, my son's 31, and I remember going out to lunch with my daughter and one of her friends and we were talking, you know, about school and whatever and my daughter said something about some sort of relationships that were going on and her girlfriend was just aghast and she said oh, you said that in front of your mother and she goes well yeah why wouldn't I uh, and so having that open you can come to me with anything you can tell me anything um, is really important as the kids go into their teen years and so you really want to start early so when they get to be teenagers they feel comfortable and then when you have an individual with a developmental disability who might have difficulty with communication this is what you're going to have to be thinking about what are some of the signs that you would be able to see that they maybe are are having difficulty in a situation. Now, educators and uh, professionals. 
we must be knowledgeable in the students' learning styles. Uh, it's very important. Now, I have worked with students with moderate to severe disabilities, and I've worked with uh, students who have um, autism spectrum disorders, uh, from those who have significant intellectual disabilities to those who have 145 IQ. So I've kind of covered the spectrum of all types of learners. And it's very important to understand the learning style of your student. Um, we have out uh, evidence-based practices for working with students on the autism spectrum. And those have been talked about this morning in a, several sessions. I suggest that you take a look at those if you work with individuals on the autism spectrum, because we know individuals on the autism spectrum are visual learners, um, by and large. And guess what? Many, many people are visual learners. And when you have an intellectual disability, the visual is very critical for you to add. And uh, so we have to recognize what is the learning style of our student. The next thing, and this is a big one, you have to be comfortable with your own sexuality. You have to feel OK about who you are, the relationships you have. Uh, and it, that doesn't mean you're perfect, because none of us are perfect. But it means that you feel comfortable in your own skin uh, about this, because uh, it is a topic that makes people feel uncomfortable. And if you are uncomfortable as an educator, as a professional, then you are going to pass that feeling along to the individuals that you're working with. And you do not want to do that. You have to be open and honest and supportive. You have to be able to be approachable. Um, as I said, my daughter was very approachable with me. And my young adults, after we started our training, and I'll sh share some stories about that as we go along, um, became uh, very um, uh, forthcoming with their concerns, their desires, and uh, they would also be very aware of confidentiality and privacy, and they would ask to speak to me in private uh, about certain issues that they were having uh, that they probably were not talking to their parents about. <laughs> and uh, so this is one of the things that you have to do because you once you develop that, that relationship and they understand that you understand where they're coming from, um, you have to be open for them to come to you. And of course, you need to be non-judgmental. My personal values are not your personal values. Uh, and when you are teaching um, this topic, you have to be non-judgmental. You have to present from a non-biased point of view. It's not about how you feel. It's really about teaching the basics and uh, that there are variations to themes, but this is the basic. And this is sort of how I would always do it. I would say something like, well, this is what typically occurs, however, it might go this way, or it might go that way. That's individuality. So these are the kind of qualities that you need to have as an educator. So parents and educators, you need to work together. Um, professionals, you need to be uh, connected to the family. It's, it's not really something that's accomplished just by one person. Now, when should this instruction occur? Well, of course, in the home. Uh, that's where it starts. And when questions arise naturally, you know, you always hear about the talk. Did dad or mom set you down for the talk? Um, it, it can't be, again, as I said earlier, a one-time occurrence. Oh, we've had the talk. Gee, I remember my mom back in uh, whatever it was when I was young, <laughs> quite a long while ago, gave me the book Growing Up and Liking It. That was it. Never got anything else. I learned everything else where most people of my era did. Uh, I learned it from my friends. <laughs> I learned it, you know, not from any adult. 
and it was just the comfort level. I mean, she did the best she could do because she was not comfortable with it. She never was comfortable in discussing that sort of thing. Uh, but, uh, you know, just give the individual enough information to satisfy the question. We don't have to go beyond and think, oh my gosh, my little five-year-old just asked me where babies come from. You don't have to give them the, the, you know, well, this is sexual intercourse and blah, 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 blah. You just have to give them the information that they need to know. And it really is nice that there are a lot of books out there now. Um, for helping parents uh, share this kind of information. And you do have, I'll just let you know, a two-page bibliography uh, that I have included. Um, so it's on the, the website. And uh, I have listed books uh, that are appropriate for uh, young children, developmentally young children, uh, that can cover some of this. We can work on this daily, actually, uh, through positive modeling and the use of correct terminology. There's a lot of slang out there, and we'll talk about slang later, but we need to use the correct words, as I used to say when I was teaching the doctor words. Uh, you know, this is how a doctor would refer to that body part or, you know, th that action. We want to start young. We don't want to wait till their adolescence. Adolescents go and live in their amygdala anyway. You know, they're, they're not with us. They're in that spot where emotional regulation doesn't work so well most of the time. So it's not a place to, to start talking about intimate relationships because you're really going to bomb. It's just not going to work for you. So start young, be factual, be nonchalant. If you make it a big secret and a mystery, uh, it's going to seem like it's something that shouldn't be touched. Uh, and that's just not the, what we want to have our, our youngsters uh, feel like. Here are just some guidelines. There aren't any specific guidelines out there, but as I was preparing for this and reviewing a little bit of literature, uh, it really depends on the participants and the goals of formal instruction. So for formal type instruction, say from an educator or a professional, typically kindergarten through fifth grade, we're talking about similarities and differences, which is real typical. And of course, you can start to get more sophisticated. Now I know in the fourth grade, I think it is, you correct me if I'm wrong, Patty, you'd probably know this, fourth or fifth grade, they get the talk where the boys all go in one room and the girls go in another room and we're talking about menstruation and those kinds of things. So, oh, it's sixth grade, you're, you're saying? I know that and my, my husband's an elementary teacher, and I think that he, uh, the, the fourth or fifth graders start to get an introduction there. So, again, um, this could be puberty awareness, where babies come from. Um, I think I was fifth or sixth grade when my mother gave me the book Growing Up and Liking It, uh, you know, those kinds of things. And then, of course, when you get into adolescence and into adulthood, much more specific information and abuse prevention. Uh, that is really what we need to, to focus on. Now, I found some interesting research as I was preparing for this about when and the results of when. In Western European countries, they have mandatory, comprehensive sex education. What they found with their adolescent pregnancy rate is there are fewer than 40 pregnancies per thousand in adolescents. Whereas in the United States, where we restrict or delay mandatory comprehensive sex education, we have a rate of about 70 out of 1,000 adolescent pregnancies. And by adolescent, I mean middle school sometimes. Uh, and so we have to recognize that maybe it's not so good to delay uh, you know, this kind of education. And one of the fallacies uh, is that if you tell them about it, they're going to run right out and do it. In fact, that's one of the fallacies uh, in working with kids with developmental disabilities that really needs to be crushed because they think, oh my gosh, they know about it, now they're going to want to do it. But 
reflecting on the students that I worked with and reflecting on the research that was done historically around this, typically our kids are pretty compliant. And when they know the rules and the expectations, they're going to follow the rules and expectations, uh, much more so than, say, a neurotypically developing youngster. They're going to make their own decisions. But oftentimes, our students will follow the guidelines. And this is the way it needs to be, so this is how I'll do it. Uh, and so I think we have to recognize that the research supports having a, a, a program that is positive for the students. So this is just a little bit of research and data that I found, and I thought that it was kind of interesting about the when and the results. Now, this isn't in terms of students with developmental disabilities. These are just, you know, adolescents. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So what are we going to teach? Well, first of all, we have to know what our students know. Like any kind of instructional plan, we must do assessment. And in doing assessment, we find out what the student knows and what the student doesn't know. And there are um, some specific protocols for assessment. In the STARS protocol, there uh, are two types of tests. Um, the sexual attitudes and knowledge test. Now, there is a test that's open-ended with verbal responses, and then there's a test that's just a yes-no uh, response. This helps you get a baseline for your students. Sexual abuse um, risk assessment, the SARA, this is a questionnaire format. So this would be more for that individual who does not have good verbal skills, uh, and it would be a questionnaire that is uh, uh, ask of those somebody that knows this individual well and can be completed. Now, when I was um, what became trained as a sex educator, and I was working with my group of 18 to 22 year olds, and I had uh, anywhere from 12 to 15 students every year, uh, young adults, uh, and I called my class human awareness, and I did pre-tests to determine their, their knowledge level. And I used two different kinds of tests, not this one because STAR wasn't out at that time. This was back in the 80s when I first started doing this. So I, I had some other kinds of uh, assessment tools, but similar in nature. And I was uh, testing um, one of my young men, who um, a hardy young fellow, uh, who is now uh, an Elvis impersonator. Uh, but uh, uh, anyhow, he was uh, in his 20s and, and, and verbal, and, and uh, just he was in the, definitely in the um, mild, milder range of moderate. Uh, had some skills, uh, could read a, a little bit and whatever. He works at Olive Garden now as a dishwasher uh, when he's not impersonating Elvis. Uh, but uh, anyhow, um, when I did my uh, assessment with him, I went through, I did the verbal, uh, the, the question and, and whatever. And there are some very specific questions about sexual intercourse as well as other kinds of questions. And uh, at the end, my last question is always, well, now I've asked you a lot of questions. Is there anything that you want to ask me and be sure that I cover when we start our classes, when we start doing these things? And he says, well, you know, I really know a lot about sex. And I said, well, that's really good. You'll be helpful in our group. Um, and he says, but I do have one question. And I said, well, what is it? And he says, well, I know when you're going to have sex, you get in bed and you take your clothes off. I said, OK. And he says, and then the sheet is up to here. <laughs> and I said, OK. And he said, I want you to tell me what happens next. <laughs> I didn't laugh. I said, well, you know what? That's something we're going to cover in class, and I'll be sure you have that information before the end of the year. So you can imagine where he had gotten his training uh, in intimate relationships. Because back in the 80s, uh, 
TV and movies were not quite as explicit as they are now, and so typically you saw people assuming their clothes were off with a sheet up to here, and you don't know what's going on anyplace else. So anyhow, those are the kinds of responses that you might get when you are working with uh, these assessment tools. I selected this curriculum guide to share with you today. This is not the material that I used when um, I first started out. And this would be basically for individuals who uh, have a few more skills, however, to, can definitely be modified for individuals who have fewer skills. It's called the STAR um, curriculum, and it's the uh, for Social Skills Training Guide for Teaching Assertiveness, Relationship Skills, and Sexual Awareness. Now, there are other kinds of guides out there, and um, I have brought with me a lot of the books that I've used as references and resources over the years to support other programs. As I said, I'm not teaching right now uh, with students, but. Um, I consult with uh, other programs that are, so I have some very current books, and I have some that are from the 80s when I first started, and those books from the 80s are still pretty darn accurate and uh, good to use and have as references. So in this STARS guide, um, there are four categories. Uh, four sort of areas to cover. The first is understanding relationships, uh, and that's building positive self-image as well. The second is social interaction, and now we're coming into talking about friendships, mature relationships, responsibilities in relationships, pros and cons of having children, um, self-awareness, understanding one's own body and health issues, uh, and assertiveness, self-empowerment, protection to report abuse. Very, very vital skill to teach our students. And so these are the areas in this curriculum guide. I like this guide because it gives you many, many activities in each of these topic areas. You could really start at the beginning and kind of move through this guide. I'm going to do one activity out of, uh, out of this book uh, also. This is a little bit more sophisticated book, Intimate Relationships for Sexual Health, um, but we're gonna do one activity out of this book as well. My other favorite, is James Stanfield, and I have uh, the curriculum here for the James Stanfield materials. And these uh, are all visual. Back in the day when I used this, I've been, it's been around since the 80s, I had slides and, and carousels and, and whatever, uh, but now they're on DVDs and, and whatever. Great materials, all visual. Uh, wonderful, wonderful materials. Uh, and I tried to, to search out other types of materials that were visual uh, and accurate, and James is still the best, I think. Um, so if anybody, anybody have any other guides that they know about that are good? Anybody ever use Stanfield materials? Okay, you like them? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, good. All right. So let's start having fun. Welcome to the class. We are going to do an activity uh, about understanding relationships. It's called It's Okay Game. Now, I want you to work with a partner or a small group, and I want you to answer these questions. Is it okay to do these things? You decide and decide why. I'm gonna kick it up, I know this is quite a high functioning group. So you decide why it's okay or if it's not okay to do these. So take a minute and work in your groups. Uh, is it okay to kiss the store clerk? No, why not? Harassment. <laughs> <laughs> Harassment. It, it, a store clerk is really a stranger. Now, there are friendly strangers that can help you, but do you kiss a friendly stranger? 
No. Is it okay to hug your mother? Yes. Why is it okay to hug your mother? She's a family member. Is it okay to kiss your boss? Oh, but they're really nice to me. They always say hi. I want to give them a big hug and a kiss when I get to work. Oh, it's a work setting, not home. And is this a relative? Typically not. Uh, and you typically do not kiss at work. Kind of a rule. All right. Is it OK to hug someone you just met? Yeah? But I hear, I hear some, some discrepancy out there. How many say yes? Depends on the culture. That's a good point. However, we have individuals that don't always discriminate different cultures. And we're thinking about safety here. The ultimate goal is safety and protection. Is it OK to hug somebody you've just met? No, it is not. If we are setting a standard for our students, you do not hug somebody you just met. It is a rule. And uh, it's a very important rule, because oftentimes little children, and oftentimes especially little children with Down syndrome, want to come up and give you a big hug and a kiss every time they meet you, because they're just so darn social and so darn cute. And everybody accepts that. And you folks working with the little ones, yeah, right? And oh, isn't that nice? But how nice is it when that young man at age 20, and he hits you right between the breasts, comes up to give you a big hug and a kiss? Does it feel comfy then? And he can't discriminate. He's been doing it for years. Nobody stopped it. And so we start teaching at a very young age that you meet somebody, you shake their hands, even if you're three years old. You know what? Because that is training for life. That is training for life. Um, is it OK to wave to a stranger? Again, safety. Waving to a stranger, you would wave before you do anything else. But do you do anything with a stranger? No. You do not do anything with a stranger. Strangers are out there. The only time you approach a stranger is if you need help. And then you approach a friendly stranger. And friendly strangers typically have name tags or uniforms. We teach visual cues. Who is a friendly stranger? These are some of the things that we have to think about. This is a big one. And this is so current and such a worry. Is it OK to give personal information to someone you met on the internet? No. And yet our social networking is set up a Facebook, go on to websites, talk to everybody. And we hear about individuals meeting up with somebody somewhere. I mean, and these are typically developing individuals, and then being injured or abused or whatever. And for our folks, and especially for individuals who are in love with the computer and have a passion for computer and access and do it really well, we have to teach some social rules for social networking. And there is no tone of voice in a text. There is no body language in a text. And email doesn't show you that person, doesn't give you all of that information. This is a huge worry. I can't tell you the number of parents of young adults who I've worked with over the years who have come to me and said, what am I going to do about this internet thing? We have to establish some rules and some guidelines, what is appropriate, what isn't, and how you go about doing that. And the last one, is it OK to give your teacher a hug? No. Not if you're three, and not if you're 20. It is not OK to give a hug. 
unless you haven't seen them for a long time and it's a side hug. I still have an annual party with all the students that I had at that college program. And I was at the college program for six years, so I have a lot of people that come to my house every Christmas. And I only see some of them at Christmas time. And of course, we're old friends. Some of them are approaching 50 years old, and I don't know how that happened. <laughs> but anyhow, they come to my house, and I'm excited to see them. They're excited to see me, and we can have a hug. We're friends now, but when they follow me around the house and want to have a second hug, I say, what's the rule? One hug. That's right. And you can have another hug when we leave, <laughs> when you leave. So there are the, the rules that you have to have, or else they will be excessive in their social interaction with things. Very important. Now, other activities you can do around this is role play. Uh, how would you go about it? In uh, the STARS manual here, there's a list of additional activities you can do to expand upon this kind of activity. You can do a T-chart and list out the, the different kinds of behavior, kissing, hugging, whatever. Who could you do that with? You know, you make a list so that the youngsters can see that. Uh, and that's, that's an important thing. Other follow-up activities come from the James Stanfield program with their circles, a level one intimacy and relationships. There's a social distance um, program, has 11 videos um, to help students visualize that whole social sexual distance um, and levels of intimacy. And then the building relationships uh, and how intimacy levels can change. Um, either because you choose it or because somebody else chooses it and you maybe don't want that to happen. And so we have to acknowledge that. And this is not from James Stanfield. This is from the National Family Advocacy Support and Training Project. But this is one of the, the visuals that James Stanfield has used forever uh, to help establish social relationship distance. And actually, in the Stanfield, uh, with the, um, the younger students, uh, they have a big, um, like a twister mat that's on the floor, and you have children stand in the circles. And, you know, what do I do in this circle? And, of course, the center, the center is the individual, him or herself. And then you work out to close family, extended family, personal caregivers, um, other family and acquaintances, familiar neighbors, and then strangers. And then in Stanfield's uh, material, he has friendly strangers. And as I said, those are the folks that are outside that stranger circle, but they are helpers. And you could tell by the way they're dressed or if they have name tags. So these are some things that you can do to build upon these initial kinds of activities um, in the first segment of training. Sexuality in the media. This is another awareness activity, and this is more sophisticated. That is from the second book that I showed you, the intimacy book. And if we look at these pictures, um, these are from typical magazines out there. Uh, and what are they really selling? This is selling perfume. This is selling a beverage, an adult beverage. This is a game. This is selling lingerie. This is selling corn chips. <laughs> you think so? I'm not so sure. That's what's happening. We need to teach our youngsters to be able to discriminate what's going on in the pictures and what they're really trying to sell. Again, this would be for a more sophisticated group of learners, but it's something that would still come into that initial awareness. Now, I want you to take a look at these two very common magazines that are out on the stands, Fitness and Vanity Fair. Now, 
with these uh, two, I'm just going to walk you through the activity that you could do with your students to help them uh, understand what's uh, going on here. You need to ask them, of course, what's the title of the magazine, and then describe the images and body language. I want you to turn to your group and describe the images and body language that's going on here in Fitness Magazine and Vanity Fair. And after you do that, I want you to uh, talk about what the theme of the cover image is really trying to portray. If there is a sexual theme in this and these covers, is it a good one? a bad one, or a neutral one? What do you think? Let's do this one together. Is there a sexual theme? Yes, all right. What do you think? Is it a good one? A bad one? Or neutral? Well, let's look at fitness. What are they selling? What's the, the story lead in? Slim is sexy. Is that good or bad? Is it setting a expectation? Kind of. These are the things that our students have to deal with as they look at the covers of magazines. And if they, um, are, uh, you know, have a lack of knowledge or depth of knowledge or are not able to interpret this, um, they're not going to be able to um, understand exactly what's going on with these pictures. And they may pick out things and make them themselves feel that they are uh, more, uh, whatever, uh, sexually oriented to, gee, I can go out and kiss Justin Bieber, Bieber and uh, you know, this is all okay, I can be out there. Or I can, you know, if I'm fit as can be, I'm totally hot, I'm fast, I can, you know, I'm, I'm appealing now. Would you buy these magazines based on their covers? What do you think your individuals that you work with might buy them based on the covers? Yes. Yeah. And so why based on the cover? You know, and these are the kinds of questions that we have to try to clarify with the students. I'm not going to try to clarify it with you right now. I'm just offering you types of activities that are suggested. And you can do this with, with uh, advertisements um, on the television. You can do it with a, a variety of things in the media. Because the media tries to portray this wonderful intimacy, relationship, whatever, that you're going to be the best, the shining, whatever. And for some of our students, they just don't really understand the dimension. And so it's just another way that we can help them understand the world that they live in. All right. Social interactions. Define a date. Hmm. Yeah, this is a big one. As I was writing this out, I was going, oh yeah, define a date. I remember when we used to talk about that. My students would always come up and they would say, he's my boyfriend, she's my girlfriend. And I'd say, what's their last name? <laughs> well, I don't know. What's their first name? Well, I don't know. Do you know their phone number? Tell me two personal things you know about them, their favorite food, uh, what they like to do for fun. Well, I don't know. They're just my girlfriend. We're holding hands. Let's take a minute. I want you to um, choose one of these. And I want you to define it or do a task analysis, a step-by-step, -step. how would you go about teaching? And each one of these seven items requires direct instruction. Who would like to, uh, who did a task analysis, broke it down step-to-step? -step? Anybody? Anybody do a task analysis? Ms. Patty, did your group do a task analysis? No? What did you do?
right? What, why would they be challenging? Language. Right. A lot of a lot of interpretations in this. Uh, do any of you have individuals that you work with that would like to have a date? Yes. Any? Yes. Have any of them had a date? Yes. Yeah. I thought I heard something over here about refusing a date. Yeah, how did that work? Not very well. Not very well. <laughs> uh, for the young man or woman who is it? Your daughter refused or? No, it's uh, clients that were one time was interested in another, another individual was also a client. Right. And so they were kind of like two clients. Right. Two clients were interested in each other. Yes. One was interested as unrequited. Ah. So um, he calls her his girlfriend. OK. Okay, so she can't refuse. So the situation was that they were dating at one time, and then one of them lost interest. The other one still had interest. The one that lost interest moved on and still has difficulty telling this other person, but the other person knows. Sounds like soap opera, doesn't it? <laughs> but, Okay, knew at some level they weren't together. I'll tell you, um, again, going to the evidence-based practices, social narratives, comic strip conversations, uh, using um, thought bubbles, talk bubbles, script, video modeling. Now, uh, in the activities here, it was to ask you to role play. I thought that was a little bit much for you to have to do today. So I just ask you to define it and to talk about it. But we have to become very concrete with our learners. And in doing that, we have to take each one of these components and we have to help them not only understand how to do it physically and with the words, but what it means and what the thoughts are to the other person. And if you're dealing with individuals on the autism spectrum, you know that they have difficulty with theory of mind and the ability to take perspective of another person. And uh, so this is extremely challenging. The point here is that we must intentionally teach even these basic things um, because it is a desire of the heart to have a relationship and you can lead into this kind of activity um, by talking about what is romance and what is romantic and things like that so there are about eight activities around just asking for a date now, we haven't even gotten to sexual intercourse yet, have we? And all of this is about understanding um, the youngsters. So we'll move on to the next section, which is sexual awareness. I'm starting real basic here with the group, public and private. Public and private can start very, very young, um, of course. First of all, we're talking here about public and private places, at home, at school, and at work. What are some of the public places at home? The living room, what else? The kitchen, what else? The what? Front yard. Right. A public place is a place where anybody has access to it. What are private places at home? The bathroom and your bedroom, unless you're sharing your bedroom with someone. We need to just be as basic as that with our students. What about school? What is public at school? The classroom. The what? 
playground, sure, because there's kids all over the place. Well, so like what's private at school? Bathroom stall. Bathroom stall with the door closed, but is the bathroom actually private? No, because even though the door is closed, somebody else could come in. There really isn't a private place at school. There is not a private place for you to go and touch your private parts. Because we really don't touch our private parts at school. In other words, masturbation is not okay at school. And we need to teach that sort of thing. And young adolescents can't help it because all of a sudden their body has just changed and they don't know why it changed and so they're, it may be that they're just trying to adjust. I had one young man with Asperger's syndrome who was in eighth grade and his uh, uh, penis would get hard at school. And he wore sweatpants because he had some tactile issues with clothes. And he was also about 5'8 and weighed 180 pounds. He wasn't petite. <laughs> and we had to address this issue because everybody else saw it. <laughs> and he just didn't really know what was going on. And he'd get up and walk around and whatever. So we, Dad had the talk and I had a talk. And we talked about how he could, he, because he really had to leave the area. Um, we changed his clothing. He started to wear tighter fitting clothing. And he had to, um, he had to go to uh, the bathroom, not necessarily to masturbate, but to adjust himself. Because he wasn't really masturbating, he was just, you know, getting stimulated and something was happening. And uh, the problem was he would stand up and say, I have to go and adjust myself. <laughs> so we had to work on leaving quietly. So there's so many other social things that come around public and private. And of course at work there really aren't any private places either. Um, I have one little quick story about public and private um, and defining what private means. And I had kind of said, well, no one else can see you. No one else is around. Um, and so I had a couple of my college students um, who kind of liked each other. And they used public transportation. And they had to wait at a bus stop. And there was a nice bench at the bus stop. And so they got behind the bench at the bus stop and were having a little moment of kissing and whatever. They were not being inappropriate, but they weren't, you know, really they weren't being appropriate. Um, and it happened to be across from the County Office of Education because they just left a job site there. <laughs> so I got a call and said, Candace, two of your students <laughs> are behind the bench. And when I talked to them and debriefed, and they said, but it was private. We couldn't see anybody. And I said, but other people could see you. And so again, defining that clearly, because even though they think they're doing the right thing, sometimes it isn't. My last little activity is the assertive part, sexual um, prevention. Can our kids say no? They say no, but oftentimes we don't want them to say no because we want them to be compliant. And students are often taught to be very compliant. And this becomes a problem. Do you know of those individuals who are exploited? A high percentage are exploited by family members um, or people that they, they know really well. And they don't know how to say no. So everybody has the right to say no. They really do. How do people say no? Well, they can use words and actions. But if I say no, does that mean no? Tell me. Show me no and mean it. Not I want to hear it. No. No. Really? No. no. Better? No. No. 
You have to teach them dramatically to say no, mean no, put their hand up, move away, use their body. If they don't feel comfortable with something, they have to be able to say no. That is the first step to preventing abuse. And then go tell a safe person. And that's the other part of the training. So these are just an overview of activities. So you've had an opportunity to feel what it's like to experience these activities. They're not easy. And they're not easy for you as the educator to set them up. But why do we teach these things? Because we want to improve the quality of life of the individuals that we care about and that we work with. It also reduces anxiety for our students, confusion and fear. It promotes health and safety. I've known a couple of individuals who have gotten pregnant and don't know how it happened, don't know what happened. Um, and of course, bottom line, it prevents abuse. So how do we structure our training? It can be group or individual, both are appropriate, but it has to be based on the needs and the learning style. Um, the benefit uh, of participating in a group is that you know it, it kind of demystifies some of the, the things that are concerning to individuals. Group size, um, four to eight, and having additional trainers there, especially if you're breaking it down and doing pair type activities or role play, you really need to give them the adult support. Um, so two to three individuals per one trainer is a, a great ratio. Now again, you're gonna have to work this out within whatever system. For myself, I had a class of 12, I had 12, but I had two staff with me, uh, so I was able to do that. Um, co-ed or gender specific. Co-ed, again, is more real world. It sort of um, demystifies everything, as I said, um, but it, uh, it really depends on the content and the comfort level of the trainer and the participants. I always did uh, co-ed until oh, I was been doing it a couple of years and I had some of the, the girls say, we want to have a girls group. And I said, well, okay. And uh, so I talked to the guys, I said, would you guys like to have a guys group? And they said, yeah. And so we still did our whole group and then we had on one day a girls group and on another day uh, a guys group. And then we could talk about things more specifically at, at a, a comfort level, things like masturbation or condom use or um, menstruation or, or things like that. Um, and sort of the, the level of, of um, embarrassment possibly or uh, comfort uh, could be increased for the students. So it just, it just depends on the topic and, and the group. But as I said, the real world is uh, sort of demystifying it, having everybody together. Now, frequency, um, I held my groups once a week for the, the, the uh, whole group and then um, once a week for the guy group and the, and the girl group. Uh, mine was a basic class period, uh, about 45 minutes, 45 to 50 minutes. Um, you can have them be longer depending on what you're doing or the availability. You can divide the sessions across the school calendar or um, in uh, the STARS manual, they suggest about 10 weeks on a topic uh, and then moving on. Pace is going to depend on your participants uh, and their learning style. Bottom line, confidentially, confidentiality is built into every lesson. You, you model it, you know, this is private conversation we're having, this is a private intimate talk, we're not going to be sharing it, you're not gonna talk about it outside of here except to family members. I always communicated with family members. Uh, most of my students were um, 
uh, not conserved, but gave me permission to um, those that were 21 and 22 to communicate with their families, and those that were younger, I got per signed permission to do the trainings. Uh, again, well, there's the confidentiality um, topic I just mentioned. Um, how to teach this, how to go about teaching it. Again, your instructional pace is based on the learning styles. Keep everything simple but accurate, and I would add in here, make it visual. You want to desensitize those slang words and replace them with doctor words, as I said earlier, for body parts and intimacy making it visual and real. The photographs that I showed from the stand field are actual photographs of nude men and nude women when we talk about body parts. Um, role play, video, modeling, drama, doing task analysis, uh, as we've already talked about for the um, learning how to do these things. And then practicing in the natural, real life situation. You learn it in the classroom, you take it to the workshop or to the, to the home or the school. Now, one of the things that I have to tell you, this is really huge. This is the biggest thing that you're going to have to do, and I'll tell you what, the first time I did this, I thought I was on a sinking ship. As, as cool and confident as I thought I was, um, when I said, and this is a penis. Tell me what you call it. <laughs> Slang words, come on. What do you call it? Well, wee wee pee pee. Wee wee. PP. What else? Well, oh, that's a good one. All right, I didn't hear it again. Say it loud. Geschlong. All right. I've also had students say that's bad or that's nasty, and that's all they know for. for uh, okay. Sure. But things like dick and prick and all these other kinds of words, you gotta get them out, and you have to keep a straight face because you're gonna to wanna to be crawling under the table too, because it's gonna make you feel uncomfortable at first. And what do we call a vagina? What are the slang words for vagina? I'm waiting for you to answer. <laughs> huh? Hoochie. All right, do you see how uncomfortable you folks feel? even participating and giving me the slang back. You've got to be comfortable with this. And then what is sexual intercourse in the slang world? Nobody wants to say the F word, do they? <laughs> this is where you have to be comfortable because if you're not comfortable, they're not gonna be comfortable, they're gonna think it's nasty and that you're talking about bad things. This is where you start, though, when you get into that whole body part, et cetera, because they've heard these other terms. So we're going to learn the doctor terms. And you have to keep your straight face. You have to be comfortable. And you will become desensitized to it. How to teach the content? You can make it visual with binder. Um, you know, of all the things they're learning, videos, anatomically correct dolls, that's what you were sharing with me that you use, all of these kinds of things can help you teach your content. Keep it simple, make it visual, understand your learner. So how to teach content? Stay calm. Keep your cool, especially when participants throw you a curveball. When somebody brings up something that you feel uncomfortable talking about in the group or shouldn't be talked about in the group because of confidentiality, here's what you do. You say, let's talk about that later. I understand your concern about that. You might then give the students some facts to explore or the, the, you know, talk to them about the topic in private. You might even bring somebody else in if you don't feel that you have the information or the background, you might refer the student to an agency or someone else. When I had one of my students come up and say, I want to have a baby, and I said, do you think now's a good time? You're in school. I, I 
took her to Planned Parenthood and let her go in and talk to them about birth control and things like that. When I had students who didn't want to have a baby, we talked about informed consent, being able to get a vasectomy or a tubal ligation, giving informed consent. These are the kinds of things that you need additional help for, but may come up, and you need to be able to handle it, not you necessarily taking care of it. Parents have an influence. Service providers have an influence. Here is my thought for the parents. You should teach your child about sex for the same reason that you teach them how to cross the street, so that they can broaden their horizons without getting hurt. Nothing will guard them against getting hurt, but straight talk and training given with affection and a little humor will lessen the risk and increase the pleasure in their life. And that is a quote from a parent, not from me. And for service providers, the rule of thumb for program policy should be to provide the same level of respect, privacy, and social opportunities that a person without disabilities expects in their own homes, in their workplace, and in the community support for adults to make it in the community requires opportunities for choice, decision making, and social relationships. And that is from the STARS handbook. So today, I've tried to answer all of these questions for you. I hope I've given you some information that's going to help you, because there's one last question that we have to ask. How are you going to help out? What are you going to do with the individuals you care about and that you serve? I really hope that I have been helpful today. I've enjoyed putting this together. It's fun to be able to do this. Uh, and I thank you for spending the afternoon with me. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with a promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.